Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live right here on Giants.com and the Giants mobile app. John Schmelk, Lance Meadow with you. The phone number is 201-939-4513, 201-939-4513. Hashtag Giants Chat on Twitter. If you want to get in touch with us that way, you certainly can. Uh, hopefully, in a couple minutes, we're going to talk to Charlie Campbell from Walter Football. He has his real pulse on exactly what could happen late here. There's a bunch of pivot points to this draft, so... We'll have Charlie kind of give us a little down on what he's here in terms of what teams might do, what trades might happen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Hopefully we'll have Charlie up in a little bit here. Uh, I know we usually do a mock draft today. Well, we did it. It's on the Giants Huddle Podcast. Joe, check it out. If it's not posted up yet, it should be in a few minutes. And, you know, by the time the show is over, Lance Paul and I do our final mock draft. And we're also later on today going to post uh, Tony Pauline's final mock draft on draft season as well. So go find that on the Giants Huddle Podcast and on draft season. Mr. Meadow, how are you, sir? I'm doing very well. How about yourself? I'm doing okay, and we're here. We're a day away. Tomorrow we're going to have uh, Bob Pop and Jonathan Casillas host on Thursday afternoon. So it's the last time we're going to talk before this draft actually happens, and Lance will be back with us on Friday afternoon. Lance, what are the kind of things, Giants specifically, that are top of mind for you, for me? I'm still trying to figure out who's going to be there, right? What wide receivers will be left? What cornerbacks will be left? You know, those are premium positions of need where I think you could get some good value in the late 20s. That's kind of what my thought process is right now as to what the Giants probably are keeping their eyes on heading into draft day 2023. Well, it goes back to what Joe Shane talked about during his pre-draft presser. It's it's a lot more difficult to make decisions under these circumstances than when you go in knowing that you're going to have the fifth and the seventh overall picks. We brought this up on our mock draft, but I'll rehash it again. I do think that wide receiver and pass rusher slash corner are the three positions that you figure somebody should be still around when the Giants are ready to pick 25 overall. I mean, we could see a run at cornerback. There's depth there, but then there's a bit of a drop-off at wide receiver. Do I think that high volume of wide receivers, John, is going to be taken by the time the Giants are on the board at 25? No, I'd be surprised if five wide receivers go, but could there be three off the board potentially? It's possible. So then it really comes back to, How much do the Giants love the depth at that given position? I think the worst thing you could do for any team is you wanted to take the third wide receiver on your board, let's say. You wanted to take the third corner on your board. Just as you pick, the team takes that guy. And then you say, all right, we'll take the fourth wide receiver or the fourth corner. I don't think you should force yourself into a love fest over a player. In that situation, to me, you maybe go in a different direction, meaning a different position, or... And I know there's a lot of talk about maybe the Giants with their high volume of picks 10, that this could be a draft where they look to take a few picks to make a move. Maybe Joe Shane is saying to himself, you know what, we'll move back. We'll still get a player in the second round that we like, and maybe we'll grab an extra pick along the way. I don't think that's a stretch at all. Of course, someone will have to want to move up in that situation. Of course, yeah. But once again, I think if the Giants were to move back, I mean, let, let me clarify, I don't think they're moving back. 25, 30 spots is what I'm talking about. You think about. they're staying in the first yeah, round? Yeah, I mean, maybe it's a subtle move, John, and then that's not asking somebody to return great value in terms of draft capital. Yeah, and in the same way, if they want to make a subtle move up and you go back to some of the previous sure. trades that have been made with that 25th overall pick, lands, all it's taken to move up three or four spots is like a fourth rounder. So yeah, that's if, a small sacrifice. So if you find something that you really like at 20 or 21, and one of those, you know, either perimeter players or pass rushers, whomever you're talking about are still sitting there, you might be like, all right, it's worth my fourth-round pick to make sure I can go up and get that guy. Because if you really do take a look at it, the teams picking before the Giants in this draft is really kind of dangerous. Seattle can take a wide receiver. The sure. Chargers can take a wide— The Seattle's at 20. They could take a wide out. Chargers at 21. They could take a wide out. Baltimore at 22 could take a cornerback or a wide receiver. Yep. At 23, the Vikings can take a cornerback for sure. Or a wide receiver, too. Yeah, they I could mean, take look, a wide receiver. Adam Phelan's not there anymore. Correct. Jacksonville Jaguars, they're kind of a wild card. I don't know what they're going to do just because they have a pretty good roster. So I think they have a lot yeah. of options, to be honest with you. So, you know, I think it is interesting when you look at those picks before the Giants, they might be motivated to move ahead of those guys to find someone at one of those spots where you think there's value. And I don't really name those spots because of of need per se. I list them more because I think that's where there's some depth in this class where you can find somebody. And I think it's their premium positions, which Joe Shane has talked about. You need to have really good players at those premium spots. So that's why those spots are kind of ones of interest to me. Yeah, and that's why it comes back to 
how much are you concerned or how much are you motivated to make a move under those circumstances? Because, you know, once again, I don't think Joe Shane, based on how free agency has gone by and even how last year's draft transpired, he just he doesn't seem to me to be the type of guy that's going to make a move for the sake of making a move or hit the panic button and make a move. I, I think he's more of a patient mindset. Let the draft come to me. Let's see how things develop. So even if, I guess my point is, John, those teams you mentioned, if somebody does get taken off the board that the Giants really like, I don't think that's going to ruffle their feathers, I guess, is what I'm getting at, where, you know, he's going to say, all right, now we got to jump two more spots ahead of this team or else now the next guy that we want. I think I could see him taking a step back, moving back in the draft, or once again, pivoting, which is a term you utilize because you said there's a lot of different pivot positions in this draft where maybe they think to themselves, okay, we have this need at wide receiver or corner, but you know what? We really like this safety, or we like this defensive lineman, and it's not necessarily a huge hole right now on the roster, but two years down the road, the hole all of a sudden it opens, the guy gets more playing time, and it turns out to be a very good value pack pick. I could see the Giants making that type of move as opposed to forcing themselves elsewhere. Right, and then you're planning, too, for your later rounds, right? So you say, well, if I get a wide receiver now... Is there going to be a cornerback later that I like? If I pick a quarterback now, is there going to be a wide receiver later that I like? Is there going to be a center when I pick later in the draft, do you think? So you kind of put all that together. You try to figure out how to come away, not just with your best individual pick, but with the best overall class when you make all your selections. So I think that's something else that you try to do, as difficult as these things are to predict. But all these things will go into it when the Giants select. My gut feeling here, Lance, is that there will be more cornerbacks selected then wide receivers by I'm the time you. the Giants yep. get at 25. I think you'll have a minimum of four cornerbacks off the board by then. Maybe, maybe five, I think is possible. I think three at most wide receivers would be gone by the time the Giants get to 25. I don't think they'd be more than three off the board. I would be surprised. I think Jackson, Smith, and Jigba, Zay Flowers, and then... You could pick. You think Jordan Addison's going to get off the board? Quentin Johnston. Quentin Johnson, mm-hmm. Jalen Hyatt, you know, maybe one of those three. It's possible. But for corners, you're looking at Christian Gonzalez. You're gone. looking at Devin Witherspoon's going to be gone. Mm-hmm. Okay. Joey Porter Jr. is going to be gone. Probably. Deontay Banks, probably two. I think okay. So, so too. that's four. Now, when you get to five, you're talking about Emmanuel Forbes, Keely Ringo. It's not crazy to think that one of those two guys yep. could be available. The other four, though, I'm anticipating they're all going to be gone by the time the 25th overall pick. That's why I'm with you. Corner, much higher volume that will be gone as opposed to wide receiver under those circumstances. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm with you 100%. So I think that's kind of, I think that's kind of where we're at here when you try to figure out what the Giants are going to do. All right, we have not had a chance to catch up with Charlie yet. We'll continue to call. Pearson's on the case. Uh, in the meantime... That's Charlie Campbell, by the way. Yes. Oh, case yeah. In case you were just Charlie tuning in. Charlie Campbell, yes. Yeah, we don't prioritize spots for callers, okay? That is I just want to make correct. sure. Well, the way you said that... No, it's fair. It went in one ear and slowly went out the other That's ear. Fair. Not, I don't know what direction you were going to go in. Not my I intention. Thought, well, okay, I just wanted to make sure, because it sounded like you were laying out the red carpet treatment for a caller, so... No. Just wanted to make sure we prioritize. Especially yeah. not that call. Yes, exactly. Let's go to Hugo in New Jersey. He will lead us off today first. Hugo, what's going on? Hey, good afternoon, guys. What's up, Hugo? Five. I, 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 hey, guys, how's it going, guys? Uh, since we're picking at 25, I, I didn't want to fall into the uh, Paul Dottino trap and be disappointed. So I came up with uh, a list of 10 players, and I kind of categorized that, that I would be happy with. And I sort of categorize them as unlikelies, possibles, or probables. And there's three unlikelies, three possibles, and four probables. Okay. And I, I want to run them by you sort of in my order of preference. And if I have to add a little description, I will. So the unlikelies, Deonta Banks, Nolan Smith, Darnell Wright. And Darnell Wright, I say move him inside, and he also gives you tackle flexibility. In the possible... And by the way, if you go agree, those guys are all unlikely, but go ahead, I'm with I'm, you. Yep. Uh, but, but, but notice, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying a Will Anderson. Or no, no, I got you, of course. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, saying, well, you know, I'm thinking of players that have at least a 20% chance. Um, in the possible, Brian Branch, Zay Flowers, 
and Miles Murphy. I think all those are and possible. It, and in the probables, again, in order of preference, a Deboara, and, and there's a scarcity factor underpinning that. Uh, Osiris Torrance, Steve Avila, that would be the center if I wanted to go center in at 25. And Jack Campbell because of scarcity factor again. Those would be the four probables. So any of those ten would make me happy. Just want to get your reaction on it. I think you categorize those guys correctly. I think I would. I think they're all in the right spot in terms of chances they're there. I think the four okay. that you listed as probables, I think, are fair. I think Zay Flowers is going to go higher than a lot of people project. I think yeah, NFL I'm, I'm teams. Of that as well. Yeah, I think NFL yeah. teams like him maybe more so than some of the pundits. It seems like he's a very hot name right now. Yeah, so I don't like him being in. I think he was in your second category, if I heard that yeah, correctly. Possible. Yeah, possible. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'd remove him from the possibles. I, I think everybody else, it's a, a fair umbrella that you place them. I think there's a chance that Addison goes before him. Still, I don't think that's a gimme that that Flowers goes before Addison. Sure. Yeah, but I'm just looking at it in terms of the way that he categorized it, his terminology. I I, I think Flowers will be off the board. But, hey, if he's there, you know, once again, I, I don't think that fans who like him as a player are going to be complaining because it's another option. I mean, once again, I don't know how high the Giants think of him, but just from what I'm hearing and from what he's done in the pre-draft process, I would, once again, I'd be surprised if he's still hanging around at 25. Well, what I what I try to do here is, is come a, uh, come up with an extensive enough list, so I won't be going a bit unhappy. Uh, yeah, well, and I think you <laughs> well, I think you provided an extensive enough yeah. list. You go, I mean, when you put together a list of what ten, eleven names, I mean, you're bound to. I mean, two of the guys at worst should be still breathing when it comes yeah. to the twenty fifth overall pick. So I think yeah. that's a reasonable outlook. And, and notice there are no pure setters and no tight ends on my list. All right, thank you, Hugo. So that was a very reasonable, well-thought-out call. Now, but see, his last comment, I was just going to comment, so then what happens if they do take a tight end? Now he's not going to go to sleep very happy. Because remember, the whole preface what, of his comment was, if we get one of those 10 yeah. guys, he said, that he could go to sleep happy. Though I think it's interesting. Like, let's say Mayer and Kincaid, who I think are the consensus top two tight ends. Yep. And for the people that don't know, Michael Mayer is more of that do-everything type. Jason Witten can block and catch. Isn't the fastest guy, but he's got really good hands. Good feel for the route tree. Good feel for finding room in zone. Good at contested catches, pardon me. So that's what Mayer is. Kincaid is your flex Darren Waller clone where he's wide receiver, great receiver, right. catcher, yeah. flesh him out wide, all that sort of stuff. So honestly, as surprising as it would be, given they drafted Bellinger last year and they just traded a pick for Waller, those two players are so good, I'd be fine with it. I mean, they're, they're, they're both, I can tell you on my board right now, I'll bring it up. And you'll probably laugh at how high one of them is. But, and this is not finally. I'm going to try to finalize it this afternoon if I can find the time with all these podcasts we're recording. But right now on my board, I have Dalton Kincaid as my ninth player and Michael Mayer as my 16th player. So if you get either one of those guys at 25, how could I be upset? No. Well, once again, it goes back to, and we had some of this conversation on the latest mock draft. On the Giants they, podcast. Yes. If they view weapons as opposed to taking into consideration size, where these guys line up, maybe in Brian Dable and Mike Kafka's mind, a Dalton Kincaid, for example, is better than one of the wide receivers that's available at that point, John. You know, what if that's the thinking? Dalton yeah, Kincaid, right. okay, versus Jordan Addison or... Quentin Johnson. Or Jalen Hyatt. Or Jalen Hyatt, Hyatt, okay. Yeah. So then can you fault them for saying the tight end, okay, he's a receiving tight end, which clearly we just discussed. We'll put him in places where we could have him and Darren Waller on the field, and he's going to produce as if we brought in a third wide receiver. That logic makes sense. It's not crazy or a stretch to think maybe that's their prioritization under those circumstances. Yeah. I could absolutely see that. So that's why I'm not – saying it's going to happen, but when, you know, a caller says, I don't want a tight end, Kincaid is not your typical tight end. He's a guy that I think whichever team drafts him, he'll probably finish, John, maybe one or two in receiving on that respective yeah. team, depending on the other talent in the mix. Here's a question for you. What position would really surprise you if the Giants drafted them in the first round? Tackle. 
I'd be Offensive stunned tackle, by that. 100% agree. That would be very That's surprising. Number one on the list. I would be surprised if they take somebody who is mainly an interior defensive lineman who doesn't have the flexibility to go outside, meaning maybe a like pure a one stopper. Mozzie Smith. Correct. Type. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that would be on my list as well. I think inside off ball linebacker would surprise me, given they just spent all that money yeah. on Okereke. Absolutely. And it would be the same classification, as I mentioned, with the defensive line. If it's a three down linebacker, like a Jack Campbell, perhaps, Mm -hmm. that wouldn't surprise me. But if it's more of a limited linebacker, yes. And I would argue if you're going to take a linebacker in the first round, he should be a guarantee to play all three downs. Yeah, you have. Yeah, Uh, correct. I mean, right? You have to. So Mm -hmm. I preface my statement with respect to that. I don't know. Outside, John, of those three positions, I don't think really anything else would surprise me. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure Joe Shane's going to take an interior offensive lineman. Well, the center was going to be the next thing on my list. I don't think it's his way. That's just my gut feel. Now, we've only had one draft with him, so I could be dead wrong on that. I just don't feel like, again, he's talked a lot about how premium positions are important. Sure. And you can, you know, you look at how the Bills handled their interior offensive line. They weren't using high draft picks. Well, they went after Mitch Moyer in free agency. So I would say. Mitch Morse. Mitch Morse, I'm sorry. Yeah. They spent money with respect to that. So there's not, to your point, any sample size to examine. And I wouldn't go so far to say, oh, well, look at what the Dolphins did and this and that. He wasn't in a position Correct. of great influence to say you could take anything away from that. Well, I mentioned how our first caller was at very reasonable and, and smart and, and measured. Well, now we like to do the opposite. Yeah, well, it's what happens when that name gets thrown out here. Yeah, well, I wasn't referring to him. There well, are listen, you can blame me. Then you can blame me. I took it yeah, to another no, degree. I, I, yeah, I didn't think about it. Yeah. It's like Beetlejuice. Hey, guys. <laughs> Didn't even get to introduce him. <laughs> no. That was great. Well, that's because Pearson brought him up. No, so but you know what? Know Charlie actually had pretty good comedic timing there. That was actually pretty good. It was like, <laughs> hey, boys, yeah. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Lance, the first, when you hear the name Charlie, I'm right there on your mind. I, I, I'm no, I wouldn't say I'm you're on my mind. Oh, no, 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 he's no. on your mind. No, he's not oh, on my mind. Oh, the minute I say no, no, Charlie, no, no, you're no. like, no, 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 Charlie, don't flatter yourself, number one, okay? <laughs> some, I was putting it. real estate it, in your brain. No, yeah, no, 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 he does have some real nobody estate in his brain. Has any, nobody has any free rent in my head. There is no one that applies to that label. That's number one. No, I was looking out more for our viewers and our listeners because I know some of them may have nightmares when that name comes up. So I wanted them to understand, for example, somebody tunes in a minute or two into the show, did not hear John tease Charlie Campbell. I didn't want them to get overly concerned. So I was simply looking out for the well-being and mental fortitude of the listeners and the viewers. Like I said, do not flatter yourself under any circumstances. (laughs) Well, all those good people would just go tell their friends, hey, Charlie's going to be on. So there you go. Oh, I'm sure. Hey, yes. Uh, <laughs> like wildfire, it will spread. Thank you, John, for the introduction. I appreciate that. <laughs> well, I don't think that was an intentional <laughs> introduction, but nope. So what hey, what, look, what do you uh, have actually on your mind to greet us with? See, because something tells me you had no interest in calling, yeah. but he simply wanted <laughs> right. to make it's his presence. See, that's the, that's the whole point of your call. I just wanted to make sure I'm alive and well. No, no, no. We want callers to actually point. bring something to the table. Well, I know that's a stretch. Charlie, but... does, that, does that have to do with uh, uh, with that same gif you keep sending me on Twitter? Oh, boy. <laughs> no, no, okay. no. Hey, look, I, uh, you were talking about Jacksonville. You know who I think they're going to take? They're going to take a tight end um, because Ingram is, uh, you know, on the tag, and I think uh, they got Myers. Well, he's or... on the tag right now. They still have until yeah. July 17th to work out a long-term deal. Yeah, yeah. But I think they're going to go tight end. So I'm just thinking that's that would be a good pick for them. They could use them. And then they got two guys. They got Ingram and uh, Myers or whoever it happens to be. But for us, the guy I'm going to talk ask you about, John, is the wide receiver, Wilson, who's been – Injured, but he's supposed to be like a first-round pick if he hadn't had some injuries. I don't know about a first. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know about a. I don't know about a first-round pick, but yes, definitely second, top second, if nothing else. No, look, my, my so, Michael, Michael. For the fans, I don't know. Michael Wilson's a receiver out of Stanford. Um, yeah, I, be, I believe he's six one, about two hundred fifteen pounds. Uh, he was yeah. at the Senior Bowl, and he was excellent. Uh, he was probably one yeah. of the top four or five wide receivers there. He's on the bigger side. The problem, Lance, and if you want to go to his pager, I can bring it up here too. Uh, he, it's not even like one year of injuries at Stanford. It's three years of injuries at Stanford where he has barely been able to get on the field. But if you're sitting there in round four? Three. 
three, maybe. Uh, if you're sitting there on round four, and you, you're like, all right, I don't love anybody else here. I'm going to roll my dice on a guy that's missed a lot of games, but certainly has the size and athletic profile that you think can be a good outside X type of receiver. I think Michael Wilson would, would, would be a good proverbial roll of the dice on day three. He's played in 14 games in the last three seasons combined. That's his numbers. And, 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 and how many in each individual season, if you have it there? Yeah. What, in terms of going back to his first year? No, games. Yeah, just games, games played. Yeah, 2024-2021-4, yeah. 2022 2022-6. Yeah. yeah. So, so now, hey, let's get played. right into our wide receiving room with Waller <laughs> and Harris. It'd be perfect. Why not? Bring them in. The mass unit. I'll take it. Uh, <laughs> no, I just think I think we got to look for those type of guys in the later rounds. <clears throat> what injury prone players? Is that what you're insinuating? That's who they need to look for. They need to look for players that are falling because of whatever reasons. But there's talent there. I want to assuming pick though they feel strongly about those players. You know, maybe they're falling yeah, for a reason though, Charlie. Sometimes hey, there is hey, a reason look. why a player falls. Just read it. Hey, look, I you know I wasn't impressed with uh you know the the technology on the draft room, because you know why technology can fail. And the other thing is either you're either you have to put in the information. So if somebody's a fool putting in the information, it's not going to help the technology. If you're a genius, then it will help. So um, I wasn't impressed. So oh my anyway, <laughs> well, it's Charlie, Charlie. Anyway. So, so Charlie's idea yeah. of the great draft room, he just wanted blackboards, blackboards and chalk. Yeah, and, or and, legal and, pads and no, pencils and pens. He wanted like somebody with like the big matter. yardstick drawing the grid, so you could like just do the grid that way. No, it doesn't matter. What I'm saying is, it's it's the information you put into the board. Sure, and, and, and do you do you I, think that they don't double check and triple check the info which has been put in that system over the course of the last few weeks? Meaning, this is how the process works, Charlie. You are right on point, and thank you for this insight. The night before the draft, okay, tonight they rush. And it's a surge, and everybody no, is no, typing no, quickly, and there's mistakes and left and right. And, and only interns are doing it. Yeah, only, only, only interns, interns yes. are doing it. Yeah. yeah. And, and they bring off people land. off the street who have no IT right. background at all. <laughs> the hope that no, it actually no, no, saves correctly the night before. Yeah. I'm saying that their judgment could be flawed about players. So the technology isn't going to matter because they're putting the information no, in. Oh, yes, the, what, yes, yes, of course. Yes. The, 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 the draft board helps with visuals and functionality and getting through the draft. But you could have the best technology in the world if you're grading players incorrectly and your scouting is bad. Exactly. It's not going to matter. Of course. But what that. difference yeah, does that make whether they're using legal pads it, or they have a computer? It doesn't. That doesn't change anything, that's Charlie. That's what I'm saying. That's the whole point. Hey, guys. I don't get the point. And, uh, but, no, thank you, thank Charlie. You no, no, no. Charlie. Thank and you, going, Charlie. It was our going pleasure. dark until 8 p.m. Thursday night. Okay. Ciao, guys. That's great. Wow. Thank you, Charlie. Look at that. Oh, I, I kind of wanted him to bother Bob Papa tomorrow, to be honest with you. I think that would have been fun. I would have loved to see Papa handle Charlie, actually. I don't think Bob's ever talking to Charlie before. I would love to see that. Charlie, if you're still listening, Huge I invite void you. in Bob's I life. I, I, will, I will regret this. If you're listening, Charlie, send the word out on Twitter. Put up the <laughs> put up the bat signal. <laughs> I want Charlie to talk and, and call in and, and, and talk to Bob tomorrow. To and, come out of his darkness and, retreat. Yes, because he, he, he's talked to Carl when he's been on the show. He's talked to Howard, he's talked to Casillas and Fiegels, but he has not talked to Bob. And why is it that everybody walks away with the same reaction after experiencing a phone call from him? Yeah, what's wrong with that guy? <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever wonder that, John? Yeah. Yeah. So but something yeah. tells me the next person's not gonna recommend that to Bob. I, but I would like to have that shared experience with Bob that we both had to deal with Charles. Well, his life's not gonna complete be complete until he shares the airwaves with uh Charlie. Probably never want to host BBK ever again. No, that, that'll be it. It'll be one and done, <laughs> like like we see in college. He'll be tapping out for the NFL draft after that. All right, I have gotten in touch with Charlie. He's in a draft meeting. He's going to try to get out of it to uh, to give us a call at some point. We'll Charlie work on Campbell. That. Charlie Campbell, thank you. Well, Charlie's already on. Yes, Charlie Campbell. No, no, no you, Charlie please. Campbell. The draft meeting he's in, by the way, is he's the one connecting the wiring up in the Giants draft room. And don't you worry. Specified. We got yeah. our best technological people on that. If anything goes wrong, Paul Dottino's the first one they're going to call, and he's going to be up <laughs> oh, there to, sure. to solve all <laughs> the technological yes. problems they have with the draft. Because when I think about fine. exuding confidence with technology, Paul Dottino <laughs> is the first person that comes to mind. In all seriousness, though, it's kind of funny him doubting the whole technological advancement of the draft room when, remember, we got through an entire pandemic where everybody, yeah, right. right, was on the edge of their seat with an IT person in the backyard of general managers. They got through that. But you're going to tell me they can't survive 
in advancement of the draft room, which they had weeks and months of preparation for? Come on. I think it'll be okay. Something tells me I think they'll survive. I think they've yeah. done some trial runs here. I don't know. I don't know, John. You know, I would think that— You just wing it? Big night like that? Yeah, you wing it. I mean, why not? <laughs> Come on. You know, the ego's a dangerous thing. The hubris that exists. Come on. What are we talking we, about We here? have too much fun. Let's go to Owen in Texas. He's up next on Big Blue Kickoff. We have some open lines, folks, by the way, so please get on in. Owen, what's going on? Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. I'm a big fan of kind of everything y'all do. I don't call in very often, but I've been listening to y'all since I was like 14 or 15. So, it's, Well, how old are you now, guy. just out of curiosity? Uh, I'm 26. All right. Wow. Well, look at that. You 12 are, years. You are an old All right. boy. Yeah, old. Yeah. Good stuff, man. Well, I, that's why I asked, because he may have been like yes. 16 years old. So, you know, the fact that he's been with us for yeah. 12 years, no. Yeah, I, so I he's, yeah. He, he, he is almost conference room in the basement of the old stadium level of listener when we used to do the show in there. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, that is yeah. awesome. Good stuff, Owen. What do you yeah. got today? Uh, so I, I live in Austin, Texas, and I've been to – I go. I try and make a UT game like every year, and this year I've been to about – I went to I think four kind of randomly. Um, and, you know, B. John Robinson is awesome. I'm sure you all are aware. Yep. Um, but Roshan Johnson is – also a man and i don't think he's respected enough not by y'all i feel like i actually hear y'all talk a lot about him which i really appreciate uh, more than kind of like regular draft consensus um seem to talk to him about but he's i feel like fourth fifth maybe probably sixth round projection to a certain degree and partially because i think he's coming off like a little injury from the senior bowl um but if he's there in the fourth round that's the guy you, uh, you want to pick in my opinion um but I kind of, you know, digress. I, what I really wanted to talk to you all about is um, I feel like we're two, one or two picks late on where we would like to be in regards to the draft uh, in, like, the back half because um, it seems like everyone we kind of want is just going to be taken by either, like, the Vikings or the Chargers or the um, Ravens. I put a, I, uh, PFF has like their mock draft simulator, and I was just kind of curious on who who would y'all pick out of this group. I, I have uh, John Michael Schmidt, Deontay Banks, Quentin Johnson, and Jordan Addison were already taken right before us, just to kind of make it hard because I know okay. everyone wants Deontay Banks, which I also agree with personally. He looks perfect. Um, but we have Bijan Robinson, Dalton Kincaid, Kalijah Cansey, Miles Murphy, Emmanuel Forbes, Will McDonald, and kind of like, oh, Zay Flowers is there as well. Um, and then kind of like the rest of the guys that kind of are projecting that very late first round, early second round projection. Well, out of that group, I mean, to me, it's easy. I would take Zay Flowers. He'd probably be number one on my list. I'm sorry. I, I was trying to find the history of trades. Yeah, 25. he mentioned what, what uh, Miles Murphy, Will McDonald, if I heard you right, Kalijah Kinsey, yes, he mentioned, there. Zay, Zay Flowers. Flowers, and was there Dalton Kincaid, I Ooh. believe, right? Yeah. Did I hear you right? Okay. Yeah. So those are about the five. <sighs> if it was a, if, if I had, like, a generic NFL team, I would take Dalton Kincaid before I pick Zay Flowers. But for the Giants, I would pick – was was Quentin Johnson still on the board? Uh. I think he was taken, right? Did you say? Yeah, board. he was just Quentin taken. Johnson got taken by the Ravens. Okay, he's gone. I would probably go save Flowers in that situation as well. I like Cansey too, by the way, but I, I take I, Flowers I, over him. I think Dalton Kincaid looks like the second coming of Christ, if I'm being honest. And I just need to understand what we have to do to pick him because it seems like I understand we draft or we uh, traded for Waller, and he's awesome. I'm a big fan, and I really like Bellinger. But it's not like any of our, you know, the wide receivers we have, or frankly, most of the wide receivers in the draft aren't. I don't. I don't see anybody being this like gangbuster guy. Don Kincaid and oh, uh, the Notre Dame tight end Michael Mayer. Michael Mayer. Right? Yeah. That is, yeah. Yep. Both those guys look incredible. I don't like. Uh, I'm not as big of a fan as like the rest of the class as kind of everyone seems to be. I think there's a lot of flaws in the kind of the rest of the. Uh, Darnay Washington or Darnell Washington and the rest of the guys too many flaws to be taken like super high in the first round um, but I just what do you, what has to happen for Dalton Kincaid to be a giant I need to know that what draft scenario needs to be there for I Dalton think Kincaid to be the pick at 25 good, good question um, I don't know the answer to that, honestly, so we're just doing our, our best guess here. And look, you're preaching to the choir. I just said it before, Owen. I have Dalton Kincaid as my ninth, ninth best player in this draft, so I doubt many people have him higher on their board than I do. 
Um, mm-hmm. And look, I, I don't like making Hall of Fame comparisons because I feel like they're not fair to the players. But he sure. mo- he moves like Travis Kelsey does. That's how he moves. I'm not saying he's going to be you. as I'm not saying he's going to be as good as Travis Kelsey, but he moves at the same, and he's as naturally catcher of the football as Kelsey is. So sure. that's I mean, and and the same way Michael Mayer reminds me of Jason Witten, how he can block, he can catch. He's not like you watch the tape, and you're like, how is that dude open all the time? He doesn't look like he's running that fast, but he's always open. Yeah, he Jason always makes was the, the same catch, thing, yeah, hundred percent. So. Look, I love Dalton Kincaid. I just don't I just don't know how you get the most out of both him and Darren Waller when they're both literally designed. Like, if you have a factory to build move tight ends, the first guy off the assembly line is Kelsey. Like, the second guy off the assembly line is Waller, and the third guy off the sure. assembly line is Kincaid. So I just don't know how you mix those skill sets together if anyone can do it. I trust this coaching staff to do it. I think they'd be able to handle it. But I'm not, this is not hyperbole, Owen and Lance. And you mm-hmm. tell me if you could think of a different scenario. I have never seen a team utilize two players of that type at the same time before. Even when the Patriots had Gronkowski and Hernandez, Gronk was a blocker. Gronk yeah. could block. Sure. Right? So I've never seen, like, two Tony Gonzalez's, two Antonio Gates, two Travis Kelsey's. It's just... It's never happened before, so maybe that's me not having a created enough mind to, to picture how it could work. I've just never seen it work. So I'll be the first to sign up for it. I'll tell you that <laughs> much. Um, I it, I do have one more question for y'all. If if, I, if you have enough time, I can go. If y'all don't, no, go ahead. Sure, real quick. Yeah. Um, in regards to the wide receivers we have on the on the depth chart right now, in regards to like Darius Slayton, Paris Campbell, and all those guys, um, I hear a lot of talk about how we have like all of the same kind of player. Maybe uh, Darius Slayton is not exactly like in that mold, but Wondell Robinson, Paris Campbell, uh, Sterling Shepard, Jamison Crowder we signed. Am I right with that? Jamison Crowder, correct. All like same mold. It doesn't really seem like the front office cares, which is kind of why I feel like getting a Dalton Kincaid is – kind of beneficial to that because I think you can put Darren Waller out on the boundary in goal line situations. I think you can do that with Dalton Kincaid. I think, you know, the the limitations that we have in regards to size in our wide receivers, and I feel like we kind of saw this in Buffalo to a certain extent. It's very strange how, like, the beginnings of the Brian Bean era are very similar to, like, the beginnings of the um, Joe Shane era just in regards to like the bills were projected to be horrible the first year under the Brian Bean area and I think they went to the play that was like Brandon. the first time they'd been to the playoffs yeah. in like 20 years or something like that yeah. well they also had the vet- veteran quarterback in Tyrod Taylor at that point true true He's, well not, you know where is he now um, yeah, you know, exactly. obviously not starting, but it, I don't know. I always found the comparisons to be like really weird. But they also like besides, I feel like Gabe Davis was kind of this like anomaly because like most of their wide receivers have been like Stephon Diggs, short, very quick. Obviously, Stephon Diggs is like a top ten receiver, and we don't have anything on that. Like, no, but see, Owen, oh, and you hit it there, and and, and I apologize for inter- for interrupting, and and and, no, and, and 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 you can certainly finish when I'm done. But that to me is the difference, right? Even if you look at what Mike mm-hmm. Kafka had in Kansas City, right? You had Tyree mm-hmm. Kill and Miko Hardman, all these little guys just running yeah. around a million miles an hour. So I, I mm-hmm. think they would be more apt to duplicate that skill set at wide receiver because it's a fast guy that can run routes really well and get open rather than duplicate the skill set of a tight end when they make that pick. Because, look, you have three wide receivers mm-hmm. or two, depending on your you know personnel group, obviously, on the field at once. And just based on what I've seen from from these groups and the way they talk about the position and stuff like that, I feel like they'd have an easier job of utilizing – I'll put it this way. Let's say they draft Zay Flowers. I think the coaching staff would find it easier to utilize Zay Flowers and Wanda Robinson at the same time rather than a Dalton Kincaid and a Darren Waller at the same time. Yeah. No, I think that's fair. Sure. Absolutely. But I do think that the point is well taken. I don't think they're consumed by size because of who they brought in. But also keep in mind, when you bring up the wide receiver core, a number of those guys that you listed were not given multi-year deals. So they're not necessarily guaranteed to be here long term. That's more of a reason why I wouldn't be consumed with size. Because a year from now, two or three of those guys who are on the smaller side 
are not even in the equation, and then you're going to need perhaps a player in the draft that can assume that position. That's more of a reason why I, I don't think they're saying, well, we need a slot guy that's 5'10", we need an outside guy that's 6'3", and then we need an in-between. I just don't think that's how Brian Dable and Mike Kafka think. I think they think, hey, this guy's talented, he's got speed, he's got athleticism, we're going to scheme accordingly to get the guy And open. by the way, and I'm of the, of the group that says I want to... I want a basketball team wide receiver core, right? Where you have guys with different skill sets. But to Lance's point, I'm not sure that's what the coaching staff necessarily prioritizes. Sure. And that, and that may overall really makes sense. Um, I'm going to ask one more question until y'all kick me off. Sure. What, what's the max or what's the minimum amount you would need to move down within the first round or the early second round? Like if, uh, say, like Kansas City sees B. John Robinson and is still there at 25 and we have Saquon Barkley, what is like the minimum amount? Because I get twenty five kind of to thirty one. Twenty five to thirty one. I'd need their third round pick. Okay, I get kind of confused with like the uh, the requirements for like the amounts because it kind of seems like everyone has their own. They like, do. Well, you know, because every, the they, Jimmy Johnson wave. Yeah, like there, there's like no. The I didn't mean to cut you off, Owen. There is no. no people could say that there's boxes and charts that they subscribe to. Every team to. has their own chart. Yeah. Everyone is going to value things differently. So that's more of a reason why it doesn't work like mathematics, where there's one rule of thumb and it applies across the board. You might, and sure, that makes a lot more sense, to be honest. But it, and this probably is not a question that's really possible to be answered, but how much of the, the skill level of a particular draft class plays into the amount of like how you grade these kind of picks in regards to like um, compensation? Say that again? It, so uh, I, I'll try to uh, ask this in a way that makes a little bit more sense. Um, so, like at twenty-five, you know, say we have a, the, you know, this draft class. I feel like everyone is like slightly a little down on it, even compared to like last year. So, say this is like a, 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 a draft class that's like a B overall, uh, and that you know, from twenty-five to thirty-one, you need a third-round pick. But say this draft class is an A, and you have you know guys graded like the majority of people have guys graded, you know in like a top percentile you have 25 like graded first round picks does that draft class from like or that compensation from 25 to 31 is that raised to like a second round pick the draft well class is i mean my answer would be sense? no owen because he, you, owen. here's the other thing that you have to keep in mind you may think very highly of the draft class the team you're trading with does not necessarily think the same way. Yeah, they want, so, they're want. they trying to get a specific player. Yeah, well, and here's the other thing. You don't know necessarily what player they're going after. Right. So that's another reason why it'd be hard to get in your mind the return value because unless that team is telling you, oh, yeah, we're going to move up, why would they tell you who they're going to move up to grab? Because maybe it's a player you love and now you don't want to make the trade. So it'd be very hard to gauge that and equate that to value. So my answer would be that's another fluctuating item that's going to vary from team to team. Because the way, I guarantee you, if you looked at everybody's draft board, you would find this team has 25 guys that have first-round grades. This team has 15. Another team has 17. It's not going to be anywhere even across the board. 201-939-4513. 201-939-4513. I mentioned earlier, but just a reminder, folks, go subscribe to that Giants Huddle podcast. Go subscribe to Draft Season. We have two mock drafts coming out today and a lot of other great interviews in the past uh, few weeks, really. Just uh, some of the best analysts in the whole country breaking down the NFL draft. Make sure you go check it out. John Settle Podcast and Draft Season. Tony, Pauline, and I kind of cover the NFL draft as a whole. Find it on your favorite podcast platforms, the Giants app, or Giants.com slash podcast. Let's go back to our very busy phones. Now, again, we're going to try to get Charlie Cam on at some point. By the end of the show, hopefully in the next 20 minutes or so. If you go long, we'll go long. Let's go to uh, Stephen in Atlanta. He's up next. Hi, Stephen. Hey, John. How are you? Yep. Good. All right. Um, it's interesting. For, for, I want to make two rounds just listening to it. First of all, I, I just want to ask a question. Has Charlie ever said anything positive on any call he has ever made to BBKR? Yes, ab ab absolutely. He, he he says positive things about Will Beattie all the time. <laughs> Um, <laughs> then, uh, he, he usually loves the backup quarterback is usually one of his favorite players. So yeah, so, like <laughs> there are some individual positive things that he brings to the table. Yeah. He was a big fan of Davis Webb being hired by the Denver Broncos. He highly supported that move. Was he excited about oh, that? Oh, tremendous. Yes. He I was didn't know that. Falling on the floor as he was saying that. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, the, uh, the last caller had some very good points, but uh, it's interesting. I want to bring up uh, Travis Kelsey. Do you know Travis Kelsey was drafted in the infamous 2013 draft, and he was the third tight end taken. He was taken in the third round. Yep, on sure. there. So, so while I, I like Dalton Kincaid, and I think he would be a very good one, I'd be thrilled if, if we drafted him. Um, at this point in time, we always look at these as the next coming, and it winds up usually some of the best pros tend to wind up being in those second and third rounds as opposed to really the first round. Uh, well, I think occasionally, but more likely than not, the best players are in the first round, and that's when you oh, they should yeah, be no, correct. but 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 a lot of but a lot of these that that we tend to bring up that, you know, wind up being incredible, credible players in the future sure, years. Absolutely. It's, 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 yeah. So sure. anyhow, I, I think really, to me, honestly, this is an opportunity. I really think it would like to see us have more picks in the second round uh, than, than really worrying about the first round at, itself. I think the second round is really going to can give us a lot of choice. Um, I agree. By the way, the, ju- by the way, just a record, Stephen. This is a draft that I would love to trade down and pick up extra yeah. day two picks too, because I think there is really good value in rounds two and three. So I'm, I happen to agree with that, you on that. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, I want to compliment you really on the 33rd team and uh, from what uh, Dave Silvestri on there with uh, our lad. Those um, with the people, they should listen to those two huddles because they gave me a fa- fantastic perspective on everything going on. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, when you look at their boards, it's interesting. The, thir- the, the 33rd team really has a higher um, grade, really, value on, on the receivers this year and a, and a little bit less. They still love the, uh, court, the uh, cornerbacks. But when you, when you hear the pundits everything discussing, it tends to be the cornerbacks are, are graded higher than the, the receivers. But how the 33rd team looked at it, they had a different light on it, and it was kind of fascinating in looking at it from that, their perspective. Well, and that's exactly yeah. why if you talk from team to team two across the league, you're going to get the same thing. You're not going to get a consensus yep. opinion. I mean, that's how pretty much every year works. And by the way, Kelsey was the fourth tight end, the fifth tight end, excuse me, taken during that draft oh, class okay. that I bring it up. Yeah. Fifth, now, huh? Yeah. Who, who were the four taken ahead of him? Yeah, I'm just Tyler Eifert, Zach Ertz. Right, he was a good player. Those are two very good players, actually. Yeah. Okay. Gavin Escobar. That did not work out. Vance McDonald. Wow, so, so the fir- yeah. so the first two tight ends were duds, and the next three were all really good players. Keep in mind, though, Kelsey had off the field question marks coming that in out of correct. Cincinnati. Yeah, so no, that is that's that's exactly right. Yeah, you are right on that, Lance. On here, that's completely yeah. the case. And by the way, out of that, also Dar- Darius Slay came out of that same draft. So there are some good players that did come out. Oh no, they, <laughs> no, no if, if you sure. look at that 2013 draft, and you mentioned it, the first rounds are graveyard. I mean, it is a it's a debacle of epic. Like yeah. the Eagles are the only team that got a decent player in like the top 15 picks in Lane Johnson. Everyone else like was barely an average NFL starter. So yeah, and in that in that particular draft, you had more you had better picks in the second and third round than you had in the first round. Really, but then again, that's the outlier compared to yes. what you're going to see NFL history. And look, I'll say this yeah. too. Like I, you know, I saw a couple of stories where some people just had 15 first round grades in this class. I got to 20. Um, that's including Will Levis and Anthony Richardson. And their grades truly aren't that high, but because they play quarterback, I, I, yeah. I, I bump I, it up a little. I, I, I put him in there, yeah. Um, and that's with Bijan Robinson there, but again, he's a running back. But I thought he was a good enough player that he's in there. You know what I mean? And you know, it's just it's it's not a great class. But then my next tier lands, like I have picks twenty. I have a tier that goes from picks players twenty one to forty two. That's twenty two players in that tier from pick twenty one. The 42, where I don't think there's that big of a difference between anyone in that class. So that's why I say if I'm going to trade down, I don't got a problem with it because I have a sure. huge tranche of players there where I'm like, I'd be okay with anybody. Then my next group of players, and I haven't ordered these guys properly yet, that's almost 25 or 26 players long. And that and those are my you know great round two slash three, end of round two, start of third, you know, right round three grades. So... Those are two big, large groups of players where I feel like I'm going to get a pretty talented guy, even if they're not a, a, a potential pro bowler. Well, and that's why I go back to how we started the show. If you're Joe Shane and you don't really love any of the guys, or I should say there's not a huge separation, if you move back a few spots and you gain extra draft capital, so be it. Now, I don't think you're going to get necessarily an extra second rounder right. per se. Okay, you get a three, though. But, yeah, if you get a third rounder, and like we talk about, if the draft is the equivalent of a sandwich— 
Okay? Thanks for the call, Stephen, by the way. Yeah, I appreciate, appreciate the phone call. Then you're talking about the contents of the sandwich, right, is where the substance is uh-huh. in this draft as opposed to the two pieces of bread. Whereas between rounds two and rounds four, you think you could walk away with some quality given the fact that the drop-off is not immense when you start high second round all the way to the middle area of the fourth round. So I think when you take that into consideration, yeah, it does warrant grabbing maybe some extra picks within that alignment. All right, so just for the sake of fun, I think it was Owen that asked about the specific trade down. Again, this is the this is one of the trade charts that's online. Yeah, the previous and, caller you're you talking know, about. Whatever. Yeah. Um, but to go for it actually worked out pretty well, which is what I want to bring it up. To go from 25 to 31, let's say. Let's say the Chiefs wanted to move up. They wanted a Pacific wide receiver or something like that, and the Giants slid back to 31. Uh, the Giants' 25th slot is 720 points. The Chiefs is 600. That's 120. Guess how many points the Chiefs' third-round pick at 95th overall is? 120, 120 points. So there you go. So it works <laughs> out. Yeah. And now, again, that's an end of the third-round pick now. Yeah. That, that, I believe, is a comp pick. It I could think be, I can a, look up. Let me see. In fact, that what actually, I'll, you know what? That is the Kadarius Tony. <laughs> is that what you're um, – Well, what, what pick number is it? No, I have I have every single pick up. That so is what no, pick are we talking is 95. about? Ninety five. Ninety five is not a compensatory. No, that is yeah. not. That is that's not a, a regular. Pick. That is the pick. final pick of the third round. Correct. Yes, and the pick later is the one that got that got moved, which is funny. But yeah, the Raiders at one hundred is the pick that went back and forth for, uh, for Tony. That's the pick. Correct. Yes, that's exactly that, the one. That, that that's that's going to Vegas. Charlie Campbell's there. All right, Charlie Campbell from Walter Football. Always thrilled to have him on every year, right before the draft, and he's taking some time out of one of his draft meetings to. To give us a few minutes here to give us uh, the latest buzz on what he's hearing. Charlie, we really appreciate the time as always, my friend. Hope you are well and uh, you're ready for this draft season to, to come to a close. Yeah, I can't wait to get this draft going. It's uh, running on little sleep, but it's a lot of fun. I'm so excited to see how this one shakes out. It's going to be a real unique draft. Uh, not a lot of consensus, so it could be crazy come Thursday night and Friday night, so it'll be real entertaining and really, I think, a, a fun year. Okay, so I guess we'll, uh, we'll, we're going to try to rapid fire this to try to get as much intel as we can, Charlie. So I'm going to start here. Where are you having the most trouble locking down what a team is going to do in this draft that you really think could impact what happens down the road? You know what I mean? It's the old butterfly effect. Well, I definitely think the Texans at two – are, are one of those teams that could, you know, send the draft in a few different directions. If they surprise and take a quarterback like Will Levis, uh, that could send some of these really good defensive players down the board, like Will Anderson and Tyree Wilson, or maybe one of those guys go, and then they try and trade back in for a quarterback from their 12th pick. So I definitely think that uh, the, the Texans kind of will – get it started early with uh, with sending the draft off in a few different directions. If Will Levis, let's go with your hypothetical, Charlie, does go to the Texans, how much does that impact the desire and the yearning for guys like Anthony Richardson and C.J. Stroud, and how much movement maybe trade-wise do you think we'll see in the event that it goes down that road? Well, I definitely think that could cause a that would really help uh, Arizona at three in terms of their their hopes to move down because if Levis were to go at two, then you'd have teams that want to get Richardson or Stroud and jump in front of the Colts to get the quarterback of their choice. Uh, so the the Cardinals, I think, would be thrilled if that's the case. And then also, if, even if they couldn't trade down, if no one was willing to pay the price. Well, then they have uh, their choice of every other non-quarterback in the draft right sure. there for them at three. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that that's a dream come true for Arizona. Who are the most likely teams that could be partners for the Texans and Cardinals if they do, in fact, uh, try to find the trade-down partner at two and three? Well, I think the Titans are a team to watch there at 11. Uh, I think that the, you know, just with the situation with Ryan Tannehill nearing the end of his time in Tennessee, but still a situation where they could take one of these guys and develop them uh, behind Tannehill for a year so they're not forced to play him right away, which is a really good thing for them. Uh, so that would be one team to keep an eye on. And then outside of them, you know, I, I think that it might be a mystery team. I think you could see – Perhaps uh, whether it's the Lions looking to get the eventual replacement for Jared Goff or the Seahawks moving up a little bit for 
their replacement for Geno Smith. Both of those teams have two second-round picks, so they both have extra ammo where they could move up, and it's not a horribly painful trade where they're having to give up a ton of draft capital in years to come. So uh, it's going to be fascinating to see. But uh, and, and with a quarterback group like this, you could always have a mystery team that jumps up because especially NFC teams, there aren't a lot of great quarterbacks in the NFC and it's really wide open. Yeah. Plus with now Aaron Rodgers leaving the conference too, that adds even more mystery across the board with respect to the guessing game. I think B. John Robinson to me, Charlie is one of those players that most people who are trying to anticipate what's going to happen in the draft are just scratching their heads because it's a running back, and we always hear the rule of thumb. Well, I don't know if you want to use a first-round pick on a running back, regardless of whether or not he's an offensive weapon. How do you think Bijan Robinson fits in, if anything, to this first-round equation? I think that he's going to go in the top ten. I think that he won't get past that Atlanta at eight. And wow. I know a bunch of teams that have him as the best player in the draft. And even though the running back position has been devalued, that's to a degree. There's still a lot of teams that, you know, feel that if you have a difference maker at running back, that's just a huge impact on wins versus losses. And a player like Bijan is just super talented with what he can do in the passing game, uh, as well as being a a bell cow runner and just a rare skill set and also a fabulous kid that loves football and works really hard is the kind of guy you want in your locker room and in the organization. So I think he'll go to, uh, tomorrow night to the Falcons. That is, is the lowest that he'd possibly go. Well, okay, I'm glad you pointed it out because there's been a lot of speculation that maybe he'll land at Philadelphia 10. Now you're thinking 8 is the lowest. If I could just throw out this hypothetical, let's say Falcons don't take him. The Eagles are on the clock at 10. It just seems like, Charlie, that's against Howie Roseman's philosophy as a general manager. Do you think that adds up to what Howie Roseman and the Eagles are thinking, or you wouldn't rule out B. John Robinson being there and the Eagles going in that direction? No, I agree with you. I think that I do think that they really like him, as everybody does in the NFL. Everyone, no one who watches him does, you know, comes away not liking him. But I think that they look at it as the way they're drafting, they need help, youth on the defensive line. So I really don't see them taking Bijan there. And this is a strong running back class. So they could come away with a nice running back in the second round, whether it's like a Kendra Miller or Zach Charbonnet. Uh, you know, there's a lot of good backs in day two and into the mid round. So, uh, but the defensive line talent is going to run low. So I think that uh, the, the Eagles will definitely look to add some help up front on defense and then get a running back later if they like the fit and the value. All right, let's lock in now on what the Giants might do at 25 here, Charlie. What wide receivers are you confident will not be available when the Giants pick at 25? Which ones do you think are going to be off the board? I think the two that will be off the board are Zay Flowers and Jackson smith Jigba. Uh, from Boston College and Ohio State, respectively. I think those guys could go in the teens, early 20s, and not quite make it to the Giants. So uh, those two, I think, will be off the board. And I think there is a chance that Jordan Addison, uh, the wide receiver from USC and Pitt, uh, who's just a tremendous route runner, dangerous after the catch, I think he will be the pick for the Giants if he gets to 25. All right, interesting. Interesting, because that relates to a mock draft we just did. It did, yes, absolutely. Go ahead, John. Yeah. Uh, now, same question for you, Charlie. Cornerback. What cornerbacks are you confident will be off the board when the Giants select the 25? Cornerback, that's a good question because, there, you know, it's really beauty in the eye of the beholder. But I do think Devin Witherspoon goes in the top ten. I think he'll go six to Detroit. I do think that uh, you'll have Emmanuel Forbes going in the teens, possible 20s. Uh, but I think uh, Christian Gonzalez will be gone at that point. I think he could potentially crack the top ten. Uh, and if he doesn't, he'll go in the teens. So I think those three are the ones that could be gone. I think Joey Porter Jr. is a possibility. Uh, he's just teams view him as more of a press man corner. 
Uh, so it's just going to be kind of scheme specific with him. He has to find the right fit. Whereas a guy like Witherspoon you know, kind of can fit any type of coverage, so he doesn't have to be limited to a press man team. So uh, those are the ones that I think could, and Deontay Banks, I think, could be right at that spot as well. I wouldn't be surprised if the Jaguars were to take him uh, there right by the Giants. So those are kind of the guys that are in the mix there. So four to five, which is what we've been talking about. Wide receivers, you're talking more about the two to the three range. We were actually, Charlie, on the wide receiver top. We were having a conversation earlier in the show about Dalton Kincaid, the tight end, and whether or not the Giants would even entertain that at 25. I'm curious what you're hearing about Kincaid, how high you think he goes. Mayor, too, by the way. Why don't you talk about May- both Okay, we'll yeah. throw, we can throw Mike Mayer in as well. So both tight ends and that. Do you think that if a team is not high on the wide receiver class— that they can envision utilizing one of those two tight ends as potentially a wide receiver. I'd say more Kincaid than Mayer because Mayer is a more well-rounded tight end. Uh, yeah, I, I do. I think that's a good point. I, I think that teams that are looking to add receiving weapons and could be underwhelmed by this year's receiving class, which is definitely the case. It's not as strong as it has been in recent years. I think they could look at the tight end spot to find a guy that can be, help them uh, as a mismatch weapon and someone who can help move the chain. So I think Kincaid is going to go to the Packers, but I do think uh, if they were to pass on him, he'll, he still stands a good shot of going top 25. I think Michael Mayer could go in the 20s there. I have him going to Dallas. And I think Sam LaForda is a candidate to go late in the first round, a tight end from Iowa really good football player. I think if he had played at a more high-profile school and Iowa's offense really struggled, uh, he would be more of a surefire first-rounder. But uh, I don't think the Giants would be looking at a tight end after doing the Darren Waller trade. Sure. That was such a steal for them. And Bellinger played well last year, so they really yep. have a, a couple, a nice pair of tight ends that they can do a lot of things with. So I think, uh, you know, it would be a bit of a luxury pick, you know, at this, to take a tight end yeah. there, yeah. Uh, a third guy. But uh, but I think they'll kind of have better options available to strengthen the roster, whether it's wide receiver or cornerback or, you know, even a linebacker. I think they're going to have some nice options. And I could see this draft being so helter, skelter crazy that some guys switch to them that the three of us don't even envision getting there right now because, uh, this is a really tough draft to predict for me. Hardest one I've had to do in the wow. past ten years. So uh, I could, I wouldn't be surprised if we have some unexpected guys slide. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I think that's why it's fun, Charlie. Who are some of the with late news trickling in and information uh, players slash teams that you feel pretty confident about landing spots late in the draft, or maybe guys that you think are going to go sooner rather than others? Just you know some of the latest stuff that you're hearing that, that can give us some insight into the things that you are fairly confident about that will happen in the draft? Well, I think, you know, if you some of the things that I think could be some of the surprises out of the first night is that uh, two running backs go in the top 20. Uh, a lot of people, I think, media have slept on Jameer Gibbs and just how high teams are on him. The teams love this kid. He's a great kid. He has 4'3 speed. He's a dynamic receiver, similar to Alvin Kamara, but he's a tougher runner between the tackles, uh, and he's just super smart and just can do a lot of different things for an offense. So I would not be at all surprised if he goes late in the team uh, um, in draft night. So you could see Bijan Robinson, top 20, Jameer Gibbs there. I think Emmanuel Forbes could be – a guy that goes mid-teens to into the 20s as well. Um, so those are some of the guys I've heard lately that kind of been uh, late risers. And I've heard some other late risers for uh, day two uh, defensive tackle class, guys like Gervin Dexter, Keanu Benton, uh, Matthew Smith. I think some teams are taking a liking to some of those guys in, in the first Friday night in the second round. Well, Charlie, let me now ask you the reverse. You just mentioned guys that are on the rise. Who's somebody that maybe the media is having a love fest over, but from what you think, 
He either drops in the first round or maybe even completely drops out of the first round. But based on court of public opinion, his stock is much higher than reality is. I would say Will Levis. I think that Will Levis, when I've spoken with teams, I have not found a team yet that loves him. Uh, they like the toughness and the competitiveness that he has, but the inaccuracy, uh, the way he holds on to the ball so long in the pocket, leading to potential turnovers and negative plays and sacks and whatnot taken unnecessarily, really is, a, is problematic with a bunch of teams. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, if he's the quarterback that slides. The Texans are kind of, I think, the one team – that might take him early. I don't believe the stuff connecting him to the Colts is real. I think that's the smoke screen. Um, so if the Texans don't take him early, I could see him being a, a guy that slides a la Aaron Rodgers or Brady Quinn and those drafts were. And last year we had Malik Willis, you know, everyone talking about sure. going top 20, and then he slid to the third round. I don't think Levis would go have a slide like that. But I think it could be more like the Quinn Rogers thing where maybe he slides to, say, Tampa Bay or Minnesota or later in the first and a team jumps back in to get him. But uh, I just have not heard the love for him from teams that the media has kind of espoused. Uh, final one for me, Charlie. When do you think the first center is going to go off the board? Uh, I would say second round. Uh, unless you – you know, Peter Skolanski, the Northwestern offensive lineman, really could play any position on the all-line. So uh, in some ways, you could consider him as a candidate to play center, um, but he'll probably end up playing guard or tackle. But other, otherwise than that, I think, you know, guys like Whipler and Schmidt uh, from uh, Ohio State and Minnesota, I think those guys are probably going to be more second-rounders, uh, potentially late second-round, early third-round. Last one for me before we let you go, Charlie. You referenced earlier when we were talking about the Giants pick that maybe they're in a position where a linebacker or a pass rusher could still be on the board. I'm curious who, if anyone, stands out to you in the territory of 25 that if the Giants decide to not address wide receiver and not address corner, which we asked you about earlier, that could maybe be a very attractive fit for the Giants. Well, I think Miles Murphy from Clemson would be a guy to keep an eye on because while he hasn't had overly huge production, he has shown some big-time ability where he has serious speed, size, strength. He's just the kind of player that sometimes, as one scout said, they needed to poke the bear to get going. A little, hmm. little uh, lackadaisical in terms of playing down the competition, and then once the coaches uh, kind of kicked him in the butt and lit a fire on, uh, under him on the sideline, then he really could get going and make some big plays and take things over, uh, but just has a really good skill set. So he's a player that I think would be one that could slide into that range for the Giants. I think uh, Kalijah Cansey, the pit defensive tackle, could be in that range. Dynamite interior pass rusher, just undersized in the ground game. But with what they have there with Leonard Williams and Dexter Lawrence, if you take a player like Cansey, you can rotate that trio, keep guys fresh, you can see to really chase the quarterback and harass them in the sub package, and that'll really help get you premium snaps out of Lawrence and keeping him fresh all for four quarters. So uh, that's another nice kind of sleeper pick I like for the Giants that would be worth kicking around. Uh, depending on who's on the board. Well, very quickly, Charlie, you might have answered this in your previous answer uh, about 10 minutes ago, but who do you think the Giants are going to get at 25? We're a day before the draft. I, I, I might as well give you the platform <laughs> to try to make a prediction. <laughs> yeah, I think it's going to be Jordan Addison. That's who I'm predicting they'll take. My only concern is that the Chargers take them at 21 mm. uh, because they've been showing some interest in adding a speed receiver um, but I think where they're picking, maybe they have a shot at, say, Flowers or Jackson Smith, Majigba. So uh, right now I have Addison getting there, and I think if he got there, that's who the Giants would take. And last year I had them taking Evan Neal and Kayvon Thibodeau, so I feel pretty good yeah, there you go. uh, about reading that team there. So I think Addison would be their guy if available. Charlie, good stuff, my friend. We really appreciate you squeezing us in today. Uh, enjoy the draft, and we'll talk to you next year. Thanks, Charlie. 
Hey, absolutely. Thanks, guys. Take care. Charlie Campbell, Walter Football. He's king of the mock drafts. He does a lot of good stuff, but he, he he's plugged in, as you could tell, in terms of where guys would go. He actually, if you go watch our mock draft on the <laughs> huddle, yeah. I'm not, not going to pat ourselves in the back too much, but when we uh, knock some of those picks out of the park, I'll just leave it at that. Sure. Yeah, I think it was definitely within the conversation of what we just heard from Charlie. It's also interesting to you know get his perspective on players on the rise and players that may fall. But I yep. think, to me, the biggest takeaway was he says that this was, for him, one of the most challenging mock drafts and gauging where guys are going to go. So gonna just buckle up, night. people. Yeah. All right, final caller. we got to get Jared in Utah in real fast. Jared, what do you got, man? Thanks for holding. Hey, no problem at all. Thank you all very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, and, yeah, I've been listening to you all for – over a year now since last year when we were trying to figure out who our new coach was going to be. So I'm happy I'm finally able to call. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, even though, yeah, for sure. Even though I'm in Utah, uh, I am a TCU guy. I graduated from there. Uh, actually went to school with Damian Tomlinson. Uh, and, yeah, I've seen some drafts where I'm like, hey, I would love for the Giants to draft one of our guys. Uh, and it just hasn't happened. Uh, most recently, maybe not in the draft, but at least a pickup of uh, – uh, what's his name, um, Kevontae Turpin in Dallas, who's you know, continuing to be a dynamic return man, unfortunately, for them. This might be but, the year, though, man. Quentin Johnson, this could be the year for yeah, you. Could be. Yeah, I really hope so. And that, that's one of my questions. You know, I know that you know, it seems like everybody's sort of dogging out the receivers on this year's draft, and maybe it's just like there's you know, a lot of good talent in the top four, excuse me, four or five guys, and then after that, it drops off, but Quentin Johnston, you know, specifically, I'd love to see him on the Giants uh, because I know that he can, you know, run over the top of people. He's made some catches in big moments to actually win games, uh, not just, you know, what you saw with that crosser in the game against Michigan, which yeah. I was at as well. That was awesome. But um, another thing is he has good pedigree. His parents are military people. He actually talked to them when, you know, he thought about leaving TCU this year when they changed coaches. And they're like, no, you need to stay and, 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 you know, work it out. And obviously that, that really helped him, you know, in his status uh, for the rest of the year. But as far as other guys from TCU, um, I know Steve Avila is also, you know, on the, on the radar. Yeah, he's great. I love him. Man. Yeah, he's a good guy. But what about return, man? We need a return, man. I know we have Jamison Crowder, but dude's old. Um, what about Darius Davis? He's a TCU wide receiver slash return man specialist was like the fastest guy in college football and I believe he was like the second fastest 40 time in this year's um in this year's um combine as well as you know his offensive skills mm -hmm. uh, he's a great return man and then also Kendra Miller the running back uh, who I believe actually outplayed Bijan in the last meetup with the University of Texas there's there several guys but I think those are the top guys for me and then also uh D Winters the linebacker um and I know we got a lot of linebackers and linemen sort of in the off season and, and whatnot. So, yeah, I think those are the four main guys that I want to question about and really, you know, why everybody thinks this is such a bad receiver class. Oh, and the two Utah tight ends, those guys are both legit. I mean, shoot, they're, they're amazing. So, Very good. Been, then, mm -hmm. Thanks, Jared. Appreciate the call, man. Uh, I did not watch Darius Davis, 5'8", 165, right up Lance's alley. Uh <laughs> Combine, he ran a four three six. I did not watch him, but he, clearly he's fast. Um, a lot of experience as a returner, to his point. Uh, he had an 82-yard punt return for a touchdown and a 60-yard punt return for a touchdown in uh, 2022. So, yeah, that could be a, a serious punt return option there. I think he's a you know probably a, a late day three type of guy. Yeah, I mean, that's what we're talking yeah. about with some and of these I, guys. I think sure. Wint Winters, too, is probably the linebacker, probably a fifth or a sixth-round pick. He just didn't test very well. And he only weighs in the 220s for a linebacker. That's a rough combination. I like his coverage skills at the Senior Bowl. Uh, Avila, I think, could sneak into the back end of the first round for somebody. I like him at center or guard. I think he was. I think he's a really, really good football player. Uh, Quentin Johnson, really high ceiling guy for me. Um, if he figures everything out, catching the football, route tree, you know that sort of stuff. I think he he could end up being the best receiver in this class. That it wouldn't surprise me. But there's a lot of stuff he has to figure out. You know, there's some stuff he has to work on still. Drops, so, too. Yeah, drafts, 100%. So, I think that hit all the t Oh, and Kendry Miller. Yeah, I think yeah, Kendry Miller back. is yeah, a that's what I was gonna... nice, solid third or fourth round pick. Um, he didn't catch the ball out of TCU. I wonder if teams are going to kind of 
uh, nick him on that a little bit because you kind of have to be part of the passing game now if you're running back. He does not have a lot of production as a receiver. But I, his tape as a runner was good. Um, if, if teams think he can catch the ball and be a, an option out of, the, out of the backfield, I think he could be a third-round pick. And I think he would be a guy that the Giants could, could look at mid-rounds. Well, and that's where he's being projected to go. So, I mean, I could definitely see that coming to fruition in terms of – you know, Only 12 catches two years ago, 16 catches last year. He just wasn't used as a receiver. Yeah, I mean, he had 29 catches over the course of his career. Good numbers, average per reception. But, you know, once again, I think that's a projection pick, too, sure. in terms of whether or not he can get more mileage out of that facet of his game good runner, on the though. next level. Very good. I also, I don't think the Giants are of the mindset we're going to draft the guy simply because he may have return value. I could see them testing guys out during the course of they have training. Three camp. seventh round picks, maybe one of the seventh okay. they could. But once again, I mean, a seventh round pick is also not a lock to even make the roster. So I of guess what not. I'm getting oh, yeah, at yeah, for sure. is if we're going back to, and I'm just piggybacking off of the caller's claim. Even though Jamison Crowder may be up there in age, Crowder, though, could easily be the return man for this year, yep. and they could be revisiting this conversation completely all over again next year. So you don't necessarily, I guess my point is, you don't have to find the guy in the draft. And remember, Darnay Holmes, Gary Brightwell, those guys could be options in terms of the return game. I know fans are not going to want to hear it with the Dory Jackson getting hurt last season, but I, for one, I don't fear starters playing integral roles on special teams because... Special teams play here. That could be the difference in winning and losing a football game. All right, Pearson needs to edit draft season, so I'll just say this before we close. I don't know what player it's going to be. I just think based on the talent in the class, who's going to go before the Giants pick? If I had to bet on a position the Giants will take, I think they'll wind up with a wide receiver. Yeah, I've been saying all along, wide receiver, corner. Those are my two positions and that th- I think and, equate to need and value. And you think there'll be a better player at wide receiver than corner, right, at 25? Is your, yes, your because I think yeah, there's going to be a higher volume of corners off the board. Sadly, yep. I believe, and most frighteningly, we're on the same page. So it's probably going to be the opposite of that is what's actually well, going to I mean, happen. Listen, we can only we'll go based yes. on what we're doing Logic from a rationale reason. standpoint. That is yes, correct. exactly. For Lance yep. Meadow, I'm John Schmelk. Thank you to Charlie Campbell from uh, Walter Football for joining us. A uh, really good job by everybody out there today and all throughout this draft process. Again, tomorrow is Pop and Casillas, and we'll be live uh, the night of the draft after the Giants make their first round pick. We'll see you then.